Hey guys, Giles here. Um, I wanted to just very briefly talk about um, motion palpation and palpation for diagnosis. Is it reliable? Are you feeling what you think you're feeling? And is it a valid tool for you to make a differential diagnosis as to whether you want to use like a manual therapy intervention, such as manipulation on a specific spinal area? Now, look, I'm going to cut to the chase here. Um, I have a degree in osteopathy, I did it many many years ago and when I did my degree process I basically thought I was like the Harry Potter of manual therapy, that I had like magic palpatory hands and that I could palpate someone's spine, I could palpate level by level and I could feel the most minute rotations and lateral flexions and that would give me my differential diagnosis in order to manipulate but was I actually feeling what I thought I was feeling um, I, because now I've transitioned um, we published and we're writing our fourth book we've just submitted it to the publisher and we have a whole chapter on this sort of misconception and I think it's important we talk about it because 98% of manual therapists use motion palpation and palpation as a diagnostic tool to decide whether they're going to manipulate or mobilize or use a manual therapy intervention. 98% of us. Now, before you hate me, I'm not saying we forget our hands. Yeah? Before you hate me and email me, these are still very important and having uh, good palpation skills, good soft touch, the ability to move the patient, work with the patient is incredibly important. But as a diagnostic tool, mm, the research is not great, guys. The research is really poor. Um, we looked at 44 journals for the chapter that we've written on motion palpation. 44 journals, and out of those, only four were decent enough to use. The rest were incredibly flawed with their methodology. Really flawed. Um, and some of the issues were about uh, people couldn't agree, there was different experience. And ultimately, the inter-rater reliability was pretty much no better than chance. Um, so it was, it was really difficult to actually find any really good evidence to show motion palpation and palpation as a good diagnostic tool. Um, as an osteopath, we would look at Friat's Law, uh, the idea of sort of the, the vertebra being out of alignment and then subsequent movements to compensate that. But guys, Friat's Law is, a hundred, is over 100 years old. It was 1918 they, they did the first first one of that. Um, it's 100 years old. Is it relevant in 2019, 2020, when all the research is backing it up and saying, well, actually, you know, you're trying to palpate through skin, through tissue, you're trying to palpate joint position. And ultimately, for me to tell if a vertebra is like rotated and lateral flexed, I'd need to really work out where neutral is. And no one's neutral. In fact, everyone is wonkier than a freaking, I don't know, anything. We've all got some spinal movement and bits and pieces. This idea of a perfect spine doesn't really exist. So when I was palpating and going through these movements, what was I actually trying to um, diagnose? What was I actually trying to feel? Um, it's, look, I'm not bagging it, right? Palpation is important, but guys, you've got to look at it from, from a, a sort of a, a, a quantitative approach, yeah? I would always say, I would rather look at the quality and the quantity of movement. I wanna see how the person's moving. Look at the quality and the quantity. Uh, ask the patient, where does it hurt? Where's the, where's the problem? Show me yourself. Get them to do real world movements, yeah? That will give you as good an idea as to the area of dysfunction that you wanna use manual therapy on. Uh, and if you are gonna use uh, palpation, then statistically you have a better, better reliability of using pain provocation as an indicator of a area of dysfunction that you may wanna use manipulation or mobilization on. Or, 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 mobilization on. Ultimately, if you push on, the per, push on an area and it's eliciting a painful response, then you have a better validity, a better, better area of sort of chance. That's the, that's the area you wanna work on. So like I said, I'm not saying palpation's crap. I'm not saying it's rubbish. I'm saying we have to step back and actually think, look, what are we actually feeling? Uh, and be realistic with ourselves and with our skills. Boom. Secure. Notice my body position is facing this beautiful man. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> done so. Well remembered. He's passed, by the way. So, bring her into neutral, and from here, I'm side bending. Cool. Easy peasy, yeah? Side bending. From this position, I'm just going to change my foot stance. So now, look at the old J-Lo booty. Into rotation. From rotation, I can transition back into my side bending, okay? Extension in this position is probably the easiest you could ever do because extension is just a change in the foot position. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to contact the elbow. My thena hypothena is going to place its hands. <coughs> relax for me. And I'm going to now push my body up into thoracic extension. My hands are just stabilizing. I could have a fingertip if I wanted to. Yeah? I'm just stopping her from falling too far forwards because I want to take pressure off the lumbar spine. So all I'm doing, look, it's this movement with my leg. Extension. And I can stabilize and I'm just going to start to flex. Okay. We can transition this. Straighten the bottom leg out. And start to work. Click. This then helps me to start to posteriorize. And that can transition into a manipulation. And then back into an articulation. And then into our spiral cervical technique from the C-spine. I'm just going to bring her into a position so that I can breathe in. As she breathes out, just let the body go loose to a T-spine, breathe in. As she breathes out, just relax. On your side for me. From this position, we can mobilize into a, just relax for me, breathe in. As she breathes out, into a lumbar manipulation slightly down and now I'm going to step up. I'm going to come down, down, contact and I'm just using for landmark and look at my arm. I'm going to shrug my shoulders. CT, extension, <coughs> Rotation. We can change the position as much as we like. We can come further down if he can tolerate it and make it easier, easier on us. If he can't interlock the finger, this protects the cervical spine. Mm -hmm. You're contacting underneath the elbows and you're creating this pivot. And all we're going to do. My chest stabilizes him here, because if I don't, this is all arms now. It's all arms. This, <coughs> beautiful peacock time, remember? Drop myself down, leg position. Now, all I'm doing is I'm leaning my body, creating this movement. Use your thumbs to try and create this neutral position. Drop my stance. Create traction. Breathe in. As he breathes out. So I'm just on my way to Lower Sydenham, uh, Metroflex gym, bodybuilding mecca in South East London. Um, and it, yes, it is a leg day. Um, and I thought what I would do is chuck out a little video around thoracic mobility. I think it's really important patients do thoracic mobility work, um, especially if they've got chronic lower back issues or neck or upper thoracic dysfunction. For me, 
sometimes what the patient does off the couch is more important than what we do on it. So I'm going to show you three variations, really easy ways that you can get your patient to add thoracic mobility work into their daily exercise routine. So let's do it. <laughs> against it, basically apply the compression and almost sort of like separate it down. You're okay there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just let me know if it's too sore. Yeah? Compression and drive down. A technique I quite like to do is I'll take the elbow out like this. You okay? Mm -hmm. Let me know if that's sore, yeah? Now from here, I will contact almost clavicle, clavicular line, and then I can sort of Take the shoulder, traction it out, and you can see we can get some compression through there. And then all I do is it's a little body drop straight down. Yeah, does that make sense? You look like it's not. What are we, what are we aiming at there? AC, yeah. Oh, you can also okay. try and get, because the AC and the SC sit like this, right? Yeah, right? So we traction, just depending on where we place the hand, it's basically a, you okay there? Is that mm -hmm. all? No, sorry. A, one. Okay, so all we're gonna do again is we're just going to start to open out the ribs, supine. I'm just gonna hook up onto the pelvis with my arm and I'm gonna bring him slightly towards me. Hand comes under with my opposite hand. All I'm doing is I'm now going to start to rotate and I'm gonna to start to open out the ribs like so. And work my way out. As you do that, let your shoulder just relax. Wow. We're sitting here, right, underneath the level of dysfunction, and I'm going to do an oblique drive. But what would happen to my hand if I put it there? What's going to happen? I'm going to hurt myself, and I'm far too valuable. So I need to protect my hand. So what I do is I hold a towel, and I place the towel like that. All right, because ultimately, I bring him here, that is going to protect all, he drops his chin to his chest because this flexion movement starts to tighten up the tissues. I control, then I say to him, listen mate, do me a favor, just breathe in. As he breathes out, straight up. Mid T spine, yeah? But boom. always, boom, but always protect your hand. Now guys, I love manipulation. I use it in clinic, I teach it across the world, and I find it's a really, really effective therapeutic modality. Bear in mind though, it's a temporary effect, yeah? But there are some fundamental misconceptions that some therapists have around what is manipulation, and some of the old theories that we are still clinging to. We're quite lucky, we've, we've spent most of last year writing a big research project on the neurophysiological and the neurochemical effects of manipulation because there's been like a paradigm shift 
back in the day, we used to be very heavily entrenched in this biomechanical theory. Um, and now we're, we're realizing that manipulation has a greater effect on the central nervous system and on the neurophysiological aspects of treatment, pain reduction, temporary reduction in tone and other elements. Um, but some of the basic misconceptions that people have from the back in the day are biomechanical fault changes. The idea that manipulation is able to change a biomechanical fault, and that's just simply not the case. Um, we're not putting things back in position, and there's no research to say that there's any lasting positional change following a manipulative technique. So we have to make sure that when we're explaining the techniques that we're doing, that we're not saying to patients, oh, I'm gonna correct this, and I'm gonna put that back in. It's a fundamental misconception. So there's no lasting positional change, or there's no really good research out there to say that there is. Um, and also, I mean, especially with the biomechanical theory, the, the idea of being able to palpate an area that requires manipulation, again, the, the research is really poor. Um, palpation is incredibly unreliable. Hands up, man, as an osteopath, I, I was told that I had magic palpation. But in reality, palpation varies from practitioner to practitioner, and it's an unreliable way to ascertain if there's an area of dysfunction that you think manipulation would be appropriate for. Um, ultimately, we always talk about you test it, you treat it, retest it. And if you are gonna use palpation, then what the research is showing is that pain provocation is probably your best bet. So pushing on the area, if it's eliciting a pain response, then you're probably on the right idea. But to really try and use your palpation to ascertain joint position and joint movement, it's a tough ask. And unfortunately, guys, the research doesn't really stack it up. Um, look, the idea that I can palpate one degree of rotation at L1, I can probably just about work out where L1 is. And that's hoping that the patient doesn't have any sort of spinal abnormality like an L6 to throw me off track anyway. So palpation is a bit flawed in that respect. It's still an important process, but don't just heavily rely on it. Um, and also things like specificity, being target specific. Look, when I use manipulation, my intention is to be as specific as possible, but ultimately we are gonna have an effect on the structures above and below our target segment. And in the thoracics, it's really quite interesting because there's between a zero and a nine centimeter window of opportunity where you do a manipulation and you're gonna have an effect. 3.5 centimeters of error is roughly around it. So if you're thinking you're gonna crack T6 and only T6, think again because you're going to have an effect on T5, on T4, on T7, on T8. Um, and so these are some of the sort of fundamentals that we see. Now guys, I like manipulation. It's very effective and hopefully with the research that we're publishing, we're going to show you that it's not just as simple as I'm going to crack it and put things back in place because we're not. Once we understand the neurophysiology of the technique, Guys, it's really quite a cool thing. So stay uh, stay tuned. Um, as soon as we get that published, we're gonna be pushing it out there and we're gonna be doing a load more videos on the neurophysiological effects of manipulation, all right? It's a great tool, but always remember, manipulation has to be used in conjunction with exercise rehab. And that's the same with all of your therapeutic modalities, yeah? If you're not educating the patient, you've missed it. If all you do is crack the patient, I think you've missed it. You've got to add an element of exercise rehab, yeah? You can't go wrong by getting strong. Movement is medicine. Get the person active, get them understanding the issue. And these techniques are a great way to speed up that process. Yeah? Boom. So I breathe in. Because I want the issue. And as you breathe out, just relax and just relax the issue. There you go. Right. Again. Now in rotation, a combination of the two. This is articulation. And then the difference, as I said, between articulation and manipulation is purely speed. Breathe in. Breathe out. Speed. <laughs> and then you'll just bring the patient to me and you come into the position. Feel that now. But then you will stabilize because look, I'm. I'm in the position already. It's an oblique movement. Just relax, 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 relax. And then all you'll do is, as you do that, get your shoulders off. Cool. Super. Which level? Where are we? Where are we?
So, so if I've got a patient that's, for example, a little bit stress, a little bit worried, or a little bit concerned, yeah. So the idea is we still want the neck to be off stretch. So what I do is I say, look, just relax for me. And what I want you to do is take a deep breath in. And as you breathe out, I want you just to wiggle your left foot for me. Can we wiggle your left foot? There you go. So, That's good. deep breath in. <laughs> and as you breathe out, all I want you to do is think of the number. So you basically start to, yeah, you know, distraction techniques. You all right? Yeah. Rotations into my flexion, into my rib, into my scapulothoracic, into my reinforced scapulothoracic, hold on to my forearm, into my GH movement from here. I'm in my lumbar flexion, lumbar extension, side bending, side bending, foraminal gapping, reinforced foraminal gapping, under the ridge, I don't want to block his beautiful face. I'll come under the ridge and my chest will contact the bras. Ladies, you would place it out. Yeah. And all I do from this position is my thumb contact. It's the same angle that I'm in. It's the same angle. When I say to you, I want you to do is just to drop your arm down. Like. Are you feeling yeah. So wait, wait, um, the forces. The left arm was going. It's on the advanced force. Come back. That's level two. That's level two. Oh, yeah. That's level two. Yes. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Another time. <laughs> to hear a crack for a manipulation to be successful? That is a question I get asked all the time by students and by patients. And there's a couple of interesting things about that. Um, so I thought I'd just do a little video and just clear things up. Okay, in its simplicity, okay, you do not need to hear an audible crack for the technique to be effective. You can elicit the neurophysiological mechanisms of manipulation, the temporary reduction in muscle tone, the temporary reduction in pain, and, and the temporary improvement in range of movement without hearing an audible cavitation, okay? The key thing, guys, is you test the patient, you treat the patient, and then you retest the patient. If there's been no tangible change in quality and quantity of movement or any of the other things you've been looking for, then you've got rationale to try again. If though, you do the technique, you retest, and there has been an improvement, the patient feels good, they move well, the tissues have responded how you expect, whether or whether you don't hear a good old crack, I take that as a win, tea and medals, happy days. But there is a downside. 
Now, a lot of students make the mistake of associating a positive treatment and a positive manipulation with an audible crack. Now, the problem there is it becomes a lot of ego. And if you don't hear the crack, then you feel like you've been ineffective in treatment. And that's just simply not the case. Guys, don't chase the crack, okay? Don't chase the sound of the manipulation. And another thing is about also education of the patient, because the patient may equate a positive therapeutic outcome to the sound of an audible cavitation. Now this is where education of the patient is key, 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 key. You should be telling them anyway things like, you're not putting joints back in place, I'm not correcting your pelvis, I'm not changing your leg length. You need to make sure also they understand that the sound of the manipulation may or may not occur, and that does not mean the technique has been either effective or not effective, okay? You have to manage patient expectation, because ultimately, if they're expecting a crack, and you put them on the table, you do a technique, and there isn't one, but there has been a tissue change, there has been a range of movement improvement, they're not going to equate that, okay, to a positive outcome. So. Don't chase the sound of the manipulation. You can elicit the neurophysiological mechanisms without hearing the audible click and make sure the patient knows that they don't always have to hear the crack during treatment. I say to them, listen, I'm gonna do a manipulative technique on this area, okay? You may or may not hear an audible cavitation or you may or may not hear a click or a cracking sound. That's absolutely fine. We're gonna look at it, we're gonna treat it, and then we're gonna relook at it. And what's going to really be my gauge is looking for the quality and quantity of movement. And remember guys, this is temporary. This is a window of opportunity for you to get them into the gym. Boom, get strong. I'm contacting here and I'm on my tiptoes so that I can, look, it's a leg movement, yeah? My hands pretty much are just guiding the T-spine. The power is, even if I just take my hands away, this movement, yeah? So I'm doing this. When I now add my hands in the mix, it's just to help me reinforce and then palpate the segment so I know at what point to stop. So if this is the problem, I go, oh, there we are, and I can just sort of work on it. So from here, I drop my body slightly down, and I bring his elbows to me, and I lock it in, yeah? I can now reposition as I need to. Breathe in, as he breathes out, I can just control him back, control him back, head drops back, and I drive. Yeah? And it's so we'll do a, a TMJ articulation and then thrust to get the jaw slightly open. My chest sort of stabilizes, hand contact over the TMJ, I lock it round and I'm gonna start to use the mandibular angle, use the jawline to start to mobilize and separate the TMJ and then thrust as she breathes in, as she breathes out, follow the line and then a drive down against the jaw. Spine is processed medial border. We can come in or in. Hand position doesn't make a difference. Just the scapula has to move. And then he breathes in. As he breathes out, just let your body relax. Oh. Straight down. So I utilize the weight of the patient. Thumb over, and I will now step around. I drop my body down, nice and loose. From here I look at the old nose, and I go into side bending. From side bending, I just drop it now into rotation, and then we fine tune to find the barrier, and I back it off. Back it off. Just relax. She breathes in. As she breathes out, just let your body go loose. Straight across. Mid-C spine manipulation. Okay? Voila. Okay, so that's a piezoform contact. 
Questo è il contatto che ho fatto, molto What semplice. I can do. Voilà, C0, C1. Ok, radio head's here and I'm basically doing this movement. Yeah, makes sense. The manipulation, as we just build the pretension, you notice my xiphoid process starts to come up and over because I want to basically lean down. Breathe in. As he breathes out, and I thrust. Boom! Lean towards that portion of the table. I maintain compression. Don't go onto it, come off, and then try and drive across it, because you'll see that all the time. It has to be a fluid movement, smooth and fluid, with the constant compression through the structures. So we compress in, elbow high, I'm up into the position. I've got my tiptoe, I'm on my tiptoe because it allows me to get up much easier, yeah? If I've got a flat foot, I can't really get up. In this position, nice and secure. He breathes in. As he breathes out, compression. Voila! I'm keeping it nice and close. Yeah? Extension, and then keeping the movement short. All right, guys, just try that one quickly, please. I'm using my hips to gauge into flexion. How much movement do you see? We have one degree of rotation. We have five degrees for the whole of the lumbar spine. All I'm trying to do is start to create very gentle movement, yeah, within the patient's pain tolerance. This is about very gentle articulation into the lumbar spine. Less is actually more when you come into this. Does that make sense? So right Here, just relax, take a deep breath. As he breathes out, oh, fish bash bosh, that's a hundred belly, right? There is the barrier. Wow. Oh. Now, from here, the big mistake you were doing mm -hmm. from the last one, you heard the click and you all high five. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> but you went like this. They're going to fall off. You've got to <laughs> roll them back. Yeah. Look, you see, I won't let go of him because he doesn't know where this end is. <laughs> Breathe out. Look, there's the barrier. Oh. Oh. Over. Look, so I haven't let go, now I let go. So ultimately my hand contacts the SP, I bring him into the position, and I just, again, just relax the shoulders, breathe in. As he breathes out, I just relax the movement, and I do that, okay? So I've contacted here, and I've just thrown the head away. Ugh. I don't need it, Ugh. thank you very Throw much. Throw the ball. Throw the head. Uh. So you notice I'm just leaning in, and I'm focusing purely on the rotation. If I don't want to contact my thumb, into the position, but I still change my stance. I still change my stance, so I'm facing this way. Hey, buddy, how you doing, man? You're right. Come through, come through. And then I will push this way. And then again, breathe in. As he breathes out, just relax it. And I do that. So the two are valid technique. They're both going to work perfectly. Okay. But it's a decision for you. Up in the position and I'm locking in like so. Just relax the shoulders for the neck, nice and easy. No drama at all, happy days. Get him to just breathe in, as he breathes out. Oh, it's all happy days. Get him to just breathe in, as he breathes out. Oh, C71. Now I lock it in tight, squeeze hard for me, there we go. And as I put him through the movement, just relax. We get a click, mm -hmm. do I still go through with it? Well actually yes, because mm -hmm. breathe in, and breathe out. Oh, we may have more. Three, time. four. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So ultimately, if you put them in the position and it cavitates, you still go through with the manipulation. Because, as we know, we self-click, but that's not the one we want. No, the ones above or below 
are the ones that have reduced the movement, they're the targets that we go for. The easy technique, the easy cavitation, we still go through the process. Turn a rotation and you see I can start to build the pretension, yeah? And then all we'll do is, as he breathes out, I bring the tissue around and I drive the heel to the hamstring. It's a really easy way. The leg just drop out for me. And then drive down. As the patient breathes out, straight down. The bind and drop straight down. Good. Deep breath in. As he breathes out, dynamic movement. Straight back. Bottom down and thrust towards me. Rotation, drop it through. No. Straight back. As he breathes out, take the slack up, straight across. And then we've got traction into a... Mm -hmm. Area is breathing, and as the patient breathes out, I sort of drop my body straight down like so. And we've got a really nice cavitation there. And then we can, from this side, <coughs> stabilise onto calcaneum, come across more for cuboid. And then we can breathe in. As we breathe out, just lock in the foot and straight across. The movement. It's an LVLA, so low velocity, low amplitude, slow rhythmical movement. Don't be too specific, just work up and down. From side bending, I can change my foot position and now I can transition into rotation. And all I'm doing is I'm using my pelvis mm -hmm. to help me rotate the person, keeping him as neutral as possible. From rotation, we can then transition again into a side bending movement if we want to. Bring him back into neutral contact so he doesn't feel like he's falling backwards. Transition, supporting the shoulder and scapula, and I'm now just going to gently take him into extension. Look how I'm pushing off onto my back foot. So from this position, I'm taking him into extension. I can take First rib in extension, so we're going to have a little bit of rotation. First MCP contact, reposition my body, oblique thrust towards the axilla. Side contact, and we're going to take up the slack. Remember we are in extension in this position, but we're not compromising the upper cervical. Let's take a deep breath, and as she breathes out, follow through. Oh. What am I doing? Trap stroke this gliding movement. Stabilise, take pressure off the head of the humerus. And all I want you to do now is I want you to do this movement. And I'm just going to do this just 10 percent Just imagine you're going to do that movement. Okay? And just relax for me. Traction and surf reduction. Traction and surf reduction. Yeah? Now, that's what we're going to do. Push through some movement and have a little look where you're feeling it sore. Okay, so just bring it up slightly. Feel, yeah? So we've got some movement through it, but we're still getting a little bit of pain at end range, right? Back into the position, okay. and I will test for movement. Now, I don't want to hold him on the position because he's finding it uncomfortable. So from here, I'll hold the GH, nice and relaxed. I lock it up and over. When I tell you to take a deep breath in, and as you will breathe out, just let your body go loose. Relax, relax, relax. Okay? Yeah. Limit. You said you felt the so that is temporary guys all right what we can do is in this position i can bring him down depending on where we can get i can lock in and then from here i support the elbow and now i traction myself away yeah so rather than being up into a 90 degree angle 
I'll drop it down and then from this position I'm still supporting but if you notice my body now stabilizes and I do an oblique movement. I push off with my leg and I now have an oblique movement and I can still add an element of traction and circumduction. You notice I'm just using my body position. We can add an element in this position when I tell you to bring the shoulder up for me, okay? So what am I gonna do? And bring your shoulder up, less 10%, mate, just 10%. Yeah. That's it, that's it. So what I want you to activate the soft tissue here. Just breathe in, as you breathe out, just relax for me. Cool, that's perfect. Now what I want you to do is I want you to do this move. Killer cuboid cuneiforms. We're gonna try and mobilize to start with. Key element is we're just trying to get some movement through this medial portion. I'll tend to lock underneath the medial lateral malleoli and lock in, and then it's a, it's gonna be sort of almost like a, a, a downward thrust, stabilize, and then we can just find where the barrier is, breathe in, and as the patient breathes out, I sort of drop my body straight down like so, and we've got a really nice cavitation there. And then we can, from this side, <coughs> stabilize onto calcaneum, come across more for cuboid, and then we can breathe in. As we breathe out, just lock in the foot and straight across. Cuneiforms, we can come in and we can, in this position, just lock through in a neutral form and drive across and then down into the rest of the toes. Like rotations into my flexion, into my rib into my scapulothoracic, into my reinforced scapulothoracic, hold on to my forearm, into my GH movement from here. I'm in my lumbar flexion, lumbar Extension, side bending, side bending, foraminal gapping, reinforced foraminal gapping. You can go from here, yeah, into lumbar. Oh, here, <laughs> into here, yeah? Now you noticed I did an adaptive technique whereby I stood behind the leg rather than this, yeah? Because actually this can help me use the hamstring to drive down. Onto the ipsilateral side, I'm going to contact and I'm going to stabilise. Yeah, stabilise. I don't want this area to be moving. I'm up on my tiptoe, and from here, I'm going to take the rib and I'm going to bring the rib cage up. Take up the slack to then drive obliquely down the line of the rib. Okay, mm. this is the point. I Does want anybody to go loose for me? So I relax the patient nice and soft. I take hold of the rib cage, and from here I'll say, just breathe in. As he breathes out, I bring it up. As soon as I contact over, <laughs> down onto the rib. Mm. I've got three there. Mm -hmm. okay. That allows me to contact with my pies and then I can start to come up like this. I must be doing the wrong way. Yes. Yeah. There you go. From here. Then I can change my hand position and my pies from contacts now on the lateral side. And I'm just going to almost just push it away. So it's left to right and then yeah. right to left. Yeah. There you go. Left to right, left, right to left. That's it. There we go. And I'm going to now just lean back. Yeah. And then from here, I feel stronger. 
like so. Because everything is fixed. Yeah. And then we can just push everything away, and I can now start to. The other one was a few. Yeah. Start to work through. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Take a deep breath. Just relax as he breathes out. Straight across. C7, T1. Minimal movement. Against the CT. Get the patient to take a deep breath. And as he breathes out, straight across. If we're going to do a gross technique, I just bring the head over to one side, like so. I'm gonna just brace this, brace the shoulder, take a deep breath, and as he breathes out, across straight through. Put your arms over, lock up and under, looking to manipulate the lump spine, a little bit of rotation, take a deep breath, and as he breathes out, straight across. Once you're back. And keeping it under traction, I can just apply a downward glide to the GH. And further is the mobilisation. Yeah, so I'm just pulsing it down. You may see people yeah. manipulate. Boom. And does that does the AC? Yeah, well, that was, yeah, AC. So traction, and then we just mobilise, and that little dink at the end shows you that we can manipulate in this position too. Cool? Mm. We're going to do a thrust upwards just to gap that GH and improve some mobility there. Just relax for me. And take a deep breath in. And breathe out. And that palpitated quite nicely. So we palpate, find the point of pain, use my pisor form and a lock against it. You can see how the scapula starts to drop down. I'm going to reinforce my hand. Take a deep breath in. And as the patient breathes out, follow the breath down. The end result. I'm going to thrust straight down the rib head. So, we're going to stay here, we breathe in, respire, and as he breathes out, respire fuori, up, 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 up. Quando sono seduto, respira, lasci fuori, e voilà. Lo potete fare in quest'altra maniera. Respira, butta fuori. Compression, compression. Voilà. With one, two, three, four. Take it in front. Applicator against the joint, and I'm going to reinforce with my pisor form. Get the patient to lean back slightly, just tractioning. Take a deep breath. And as he breathes out, straight down. Now, in one fluid movement, squeeze hard. Imagine I owe you $10. All right, I don't know. Squeeze hard, right. He breathes in. As he breathes out, I sweep oh, and I drive. Word. All right. Oh, okay. We're here, like this. Just breathe in. As you breathe out, just. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> like that. No, I can't crack him. Do the other what, it's uh, <laughs> how do we get the ribs on that side? If the patient is able to be seated, like so, apply the oblique pressure, just relax for me, take a deep breath, and as she breathes out, let the body sway, nice and loose, or drop over. Okay? Opposite, we could hand like so, breathe in, and as she breathes out, lateral pressure, she slides, across. It's going to be one dynamic move, yeah? Elbow locks, look, I'm rocking, I'm on my foot. Look at how my feet are positioned. Just breathe in, and as you breathe out. Whoa. What? <laughs> crazy. Ribs, man. <laughs> Barbecue sauce. Um, <laughs> Barbecue sauce. Probably not. And what I'll do is I will, with my thumb and forefinger, I'm going to lock the bicula and cuboid together like this. Yeah, so I'm going to squeeze. These are the two fingers I'm using. And I'm going to squeeze the navicular cuboid like that. 
then my finger will just rest. Yeah, so I do that. Pull me nice and tight, yeah, nice and relaxed. Lock it in, traction back, and then I'll just say to the guy, all right buddy, just take a deep breath in. As you breathe out, let it go. Are you busy, Ali? Yeah, sweet. Um, chiropractic drop table, we're going to do a cervical manipulation utilizing traction with an oblique thrust, contact point on the speed is processed, deep breath, and as he breathes out. But now, do I have to make it? to push you down. Oh, yeah. Side bend. Yeah. Same man, crazy. Yeah? Boom! Boom! Five hundred, you run home.